for and they're kind of no friend of a beard, so I'm going to have to keep it a little bit, a little bit further away. I don't really have much rambling room either, so I'm going to have to stay behind the pedestal. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for coming to this session. I've been timetabled directly against Must Farm in the other session. So, um, yeah, very much thank you for coming here and showing your appreciation rather than for the best preserved Bronze Age uh, landscape we've had for decades, instead coming to look at sort of falling down post-medieval farm buildings. That's, uh, that's sort of what we're going to be doing. Before I get started, I'm going to try and do a, a sort of quite quick run-through of, of this, try and take it a bit of a gallop. But with my other hat on, uh, I'm the interim chair of the Equality Diversity Group at the moment, and we've got the Raising Horizons exhibition down on the, uh, uh, across on the other side of the first floor. That's only going to be here for the rest of today. It's a fantastic exhibition looking at prominent women in the geosciences over the last century or so. So please go and see that. Take photos, tweet about it, because um, we've got to take it down at the end of today. So with that little bit of shielding out of the way, on to uh, what I'm actually here to talk about. Um, this is... The data from this partly comes from a Historic England funded project, which we're nearly at the end of. It's farmstead characterisation, um, which has been undertaken across lots of other parts of the country um, under the, well, originally under the auspices of Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Lake at Historic England. This is pretty much the last one that he set up before he, before he departed from Historic England in a move that he insisted on referring to as Jexit. Um, <laughs> Um, and also set up by Robert White, who many people involved in national parks, particularly in the north, will know before his retirement, um, something which most of us never thought we'd see. We thought Robert was effectively a fixture in northern archaeology. Uh, now he spends most of his time on holiday in Patagonia, so he's, he's doing all right, I think. Um, this is the second time I've talked about the Dales and Dales landscapes at CIFA conferences, and it's, I've used exactly the same opening title photo both times. Last time I was talking about um, multi-period landscapes and uh, the problems of designating uh, archaeological and historic landscapes um, where perhaps they're schedulable but too big to be scheduled, if that is, even is a concept. Um, but here it's equally fitting because it shows down on the, at the far right of the shot one of the defining characteristics of the Yorkshire Dales, which is its field barns. It's more modern farming landscape that in many places overlies prehistoric um, and sort of early first millennium uh, other farming landscapes. So the field barn, um, we get them across quite a lot of the country actually, um, but uh, they're particularly prominent in the Dales, in the Northern Pennines, uh, this sort of, sort of part of the world. Um, we get different types of barns in Cumbria, we get different types of barns even in the southern Yorkshire Dales. For the purposes of this quick run through, I'm dealing mainly with the small field barns of the northern Yorkshire Dales. So that's Wensley Dale, Swale Dale, a uh, little bit into sort of Stainmore Gap and Teesdale. Um, it's a very, it's part of a very particular farming regime, which we know certainly goes back into the early post-medieval period, probably into the medieval period. The majority of our surviving monuments are 18th, 19th century in date. This is sort of the period of stone rebuilding in the Northern Dales. Um, so these, these are our surviving remnants. Though a vast majority of them clearly have reused crook timbers uh, used as tie beams. So we can be pretty confident that we're seeing a continuation of at least a slightly earlier style. Um, the mode of farming that they represent is uh, one that's in different forms right the way across the country and in fact internationally where you have a core farmstead that maybe is quite small um, and you have a lot of other either out farms or small buildings out in the surrounding fields. It's, it comes about when the, it's more economic um, and more practical to go out into the fields and do things there rather than bring your animals or your crops all centrally back to your farmstead to deal with, to process. Um, the field barns in particular are part of small scale farming where there was a really high premium on small scale dairy farming mainly, um, where you could get um, a substantial economic return from 
really just a handful of cows in each barn. Most of the standings in the field barns are for three, six, some of the bigger ones maybe ten animals. Um, and what's particular about the Northern Dales field barns is they're a combination barn. They have space for animals and they have space to store the animals fodder. And they normally are associated with a single field in, in its most efficient form so that the manure from the animals fertilizes the field, the fodder is grown, the fodder is harvested, stored in the barn to feed the animals over winter. So it's a cyclical system um, that, uh, that just means that you can then take the most valuable part of that process out. The, this is a classic Robert White slide, the cutaway of a field barn. Um, oh, have I got the arrow? Yes. So this is a, what we'd call a typical field barn, just so you know what we're talking about. We've got one door that leads into... Oh, there's a lot of dialect terms for the different parts of the barn, and they're different dale to dale. Um, in Swaledale, you've got um, the Shippen, where the animals live. You've got the Haymew, where the fodder's stored. You have the Borks, or Hayloft above. Um, forking holes in the back to pass the... Forking holes to pass the fodder in a mucking hole to take the manure out. It's really quite an efficient system, um, but it needs the bigger um, sort of economic drives in the country and in the region to make it work. More of that in a second. So why are we bothered about them now? Um, well, there are a lot of, um, lot of reasons why we view these as significant. The quote at the top, is the first, the very first sentence of the um, description of the special qualities of the Dales National Park. In its very first sentence, in its first bullet point of 10, it says the landscape is famous for its man-made patchwork of dry stone walls, traditionally built barns and hay meadows. It's recognized at a landscape scale that this is a fundamental reason of why the park is special, and therefore why it's designated. Um, this is one of the classic shots looking across, I think this is going to side bottoms in Swaledale. Um, a house in every field, as a 19th century antiquarian visitor said. So you can really see how these small barns relate to the little plot of land um, that fed the animals that were, that were stalled there. We, as well as the landscape significance of these, there are, I mean, thousands of these throughout the Yorkshire Dales. They are really prominent. Um, they've got an aesthetic value to them as well. They are um, really quite, some of them are really quite beautiful expressions of a local vernacular. Um, they have some measure of evidential value. I've said they incorporate parts of um, earlier crook buildings within them. They often preserve thatch lines where they've been, um, where the roof has, roof, well, the eaves have been raised to accommodate a stone roof later in their usage. Um, and in some cases, they are very literally historical documents. Um, there's a lot of uh, graffiti um, remains in them. Um, there's, a very fa there's a famous example in Swaledale which notes the times of harvest all the way through the 1950s, which is a really, really important historical record in terms of how the climate was affected, uh, that, how the climate affected the farming during that period. Um, and a little note about that they went to, holiday, went to their holidays in Blackpool straight after the hay time they had finished. This sort of um, uh, social history aspect to them. So they're very special. We value them. We, we as the curators of the historic environment um, within nas the National Park, value them because we know that particularly visitors value them. Um, they're no longer used, really, um, that very specific type of farming that brought them about, that I was sort of talking about earlier, um, that's no longer economically viable and hasn't been since the early 20th century. Um, the increase in mechanisation of farming, um, the move towards monoculture farming, um, makes, means that they can no longer be used for the purposes that they were originally built. Um, it, is, it is just not a viable thing. Quite a lot of them fall down. They're just left. They're out in the fields. They're difficult to maintain. They're expensive to maintain. Um, so, like on the top left, that's just been left to fall down. Um, the one on the top right, 
again, the roof's gone from that. This is typically what we see. What goes first? Roof slate slip, the timber structure of the roof starts to go, and as soon as the tie beams go, they lever the walls out, and then the walls start to collapse. It's a very rapid thing as soon as the barn starts to go. Um, the sort of the infrastructure of the Dales has changed. Um, that's one of Robert's favourite photos, is the massive truck driving right past a roadside field barn. I think that's actually a bit further south than the Dales, but um, the, the, the way of life has changed to such a degree that these are, these are largely defunct. Not entirely. The final shot on the bottom right um, will show, I don't know how clear it is, but the gable end has been completely punched through and a really big cart entry has been put into the gable end of that barn. From a distance you can't see it, from a distance it just looks like a traditional field barn. But this is increasingly um, one of the ways that they've been maintained is by making them, uh, turning them in effect into tractor sheds out in the fields. Um, a lot of them are used as sheep, sheep sheds now, um, just sheep houses, and the doors are taken off and they're used for shelters for sheep because that's more where the, the marginal upland farming has moved is into um, uh, sheep farming. There's very little dairying goes on anymore in the dales. So this has been a huge problem, and it's been a huge problem for years in the Dales. It's, it'll be a similar problem in other national parks. In fact, it might be the same problem in other national parks where they have these, this traditional farm building resource that's a significant part. Um, how have we managed it, or how are we managing it? Well, there's a handful of ways, um, a multitude of designations, again. Um, we, this is the Swaledale and Arkengarthdale Barns and Walls Conservation Area. It is either the, it's among the biggest or is the biggest conservation area we've got. Um, that's, it's absolutely vast. I mean, you probably can't quite make out the, the map underneath it, but that, that's, a, that's a big Ordnance Survey map. It's in effect almost the entire entirety of Swaledale and the offshoot Arkham Garthdale. Um, and that is designated conservation area specifically for the protection of the field barns and the walls that go with them. Um, so there is a measure of protection um, that that's as a conservation area that's that's a, a proper legislative designation it is statutory we can um, make decisions based on that we can act to preserve the field barn heritage there and that has been relatively successful it, it's an extra tool in the armory but that is always reactive that is reactive in the planning process um, the planning process itself we're only in the, maybe the last 15 years getting to grips with how we manage field barns through the planning process. The biggest problem in terms of loss may not be actually that they fall down because in some respects they're still a part of the landscape even if they're in ruin. may not be the best way to display them but they are there, they can be seen and they can be acknowledged unless they completely disappear. Whereas all the settlements, the little villages, used to also have their combination barns associated with farms and actually they disappeared during the 60s and 70s during the mass con uh, conversion to dwellings. Now there are some good examples, perhaps the bottom two, uh, before and after shot of a, one of the, it's a particularly large field barn, this is actually further south, this is uh, in Wharfdale, um, where that here is what I would probably term a fairly sympathetic conversion. Um, obviously, there is a detachment from its original setting because in order for something to become move from a barn to a house, it has to uh, it needs a huge amount more infrastructure around it, and you can hide that as well as you want. But there will always be some change to its immediate setting. But in terms of maintaining the overall character and form of the barn, that's probably quite a good example. That's quite a good one. The top one, less so. Um, I don't know whether we've got any architecture critics in, um, but certainly that, that wooden oriel window that's been jammed on the front of that barn is perhaps not the most sympathetic treatment <coughs> to a historic building we've ever seen. But this, this was during, I think that, that one was converted during the 80s. There was less awareness of it. It wasn't identified as as much of a priority in terms of our planning responses. Um, 
The problem with that, I think there's a, there's a fundamental distinction between these two, is that on the bottom one, the barn can still be read as a barn after conversion. You can still see it, still see its original function. The top one, it has changed to such a degree that you would be hard pressed to say that that was once a barn. And that's really the aim that we now approach it with. It has to be able to accommodate the level of change and still be legible as what it originally was. Um, so what do we do now in terms of planning? Well, we've just had a new local plan um, gone through, gone through the, the mill and come out. And as part of that, and partly through the project that we're about to finish, we put together what we call the traditional farm building toolkit. It's a very catchily titled little booklet. Um, with the aim, it's based on the, um, all the original traditional farm building guidance nationally, and the stuff that's coming out now and is being relaunched. And it's based on the approaches of assessments of significance um, that were that have been espoused through that generation of uh, sort of national guidance. Um, we needed it to be able to go to land agents, architects, and ideally farmers. And it's the disconnect between farmers and curators that is really at the heart of the problem here. Um, we boiled it down to this flowchart on the right. There's a, there's a bit of a gumph in it, but this flowchart on the right was really the key in that it showed, well, if you've got it up front, in front of you, obviously this probably isn't as legible, um, it shows our process of thinking that ideally, the first thing we look at is we want to be able to conserve it. Is the funds and can we conserve it as a historic monument? Almost always, no. But we have to say that, that is our number one priority, that's our approach. If we can't do that, then we go down and we explore whether it can be maintained in agricultural use through minimal intervention. There's a lot of barns out there now where we've stripped the traditional roofing material off and put a tin roof on them. We're, that being an acceptable compromise at the moment to it not falling down, that we'll accept some loss to its significance in the idea that we're effectively mothballing it, because that, that is a reversible process. But it isn't a reversible process if we insist that it stays on there, the slates fall off and the thing falls down. So this is sort of the level, level we're at now in terms of compromise to maintain some of this resource in the landscape. We also look at whether something can be sympathetically adapted. We have to now because there are farming, particularly upland farming, is a marginal enterprise and farm diversification is really, really prominent now. We need to be on board with the fact that a lot of farmers want to change these buildings into something else, want to change their use. We mentioned before the uh, sort of the automatic, the permitted development change of use. Um, before it, uh, it was uh, made, uh, the alteration was made that national parks would, would be exempted from that permitted development. The, the Dales um, had actually come straight out and says, if you push this through, we will make an Article 4 direction and we will overrule that permitted development rights anyway. So there was, there was a very hard line stance taken to that, and thankfully we're now in a position where national parks, that, that permitted development change from um, agricultural buildings does not apply. It doesn't help AOMBs though, and I do a lot of work in Nidderdale AOMB, and they've got some good barns too, and a lot of those are just being converted, unfortunately. Um, and finally, we accept managed decline. We have to, there are thousands of these things, there's not a lot of money to go around. So we will accept that in certain cases we will let these barns just fall down. They will become ruins in the landscape. Or in certain cases they will be actively quarried for their stone to repair other historic buildings. Um, this has been quite a change in, this, in the new iteration of our local plan, that we accept these things, that we um, in some cases encourage them, where you can look at a whole land holdings worth of barns together and let some fall down in order to preserve others. There are some non-planning led things we've done. About 10 years ago, this was a barn pod. Um, it was a test piece to see if it would work. Um, and in effect, it's a tiny little bunkhouse flat uh, made specifically crafted to fit inside a barn with no impact on the historic fabric um, in Swaledale. 
it was a success, it's not been taken up by anyone else. We, we can go around and say this was a really good idea and it worked, but there is a cost implication in actually putting it in. And we're, engage, we're trying to engage through HLF projects. Is the answer we, we pondered to go out into, uh, to get some HLF money, maybe go out into the community and talk to people about barns? Well, that seems like a sensible plan. Um, it, I'm always a little bit nervous of things that smack of sort of top down going out and telling people they should value their heritage in a certain way. I'm, um, I have a sort of a dual view on this in as much as I'm a historic environment professional with a great deal of concern for and love for the, um, the landscape of the National Park. Um, my grandfather was a dairy farmer in Wensleydale. Uh, I've still got a lot of family and friends who are farmers and landowners in the area, so I, I hear their views. And their views of the National Park are not always very complimentary, um, I must admit. Um, but we went ahead, there is a current project called Every Barn Tells a Story, where we decided that it was best to collect oral history, um, really document the social history um, of the barns in Muka Parish in Swaledale. Um, and we went out and we said, we, we're doing a project called Every Barn Tells a Story, and we just got blank stares. Um, so we explained what our project was about, and the first person said, ah, oh, that means cowus. Now, for people who don't speak Swaledale dialect, or sorry, Swaddle dialect, um, you mean cow house. This was our first, um, first lesson in going and talking to people, was that we're using the wrong terminology. They already value these buildings in the landscape in their own way. They're an integral part of their childhood, their upbringing, but they call them very different things. They refer to them in different ways. Their story is all about disappearing off to the cows at the end of the day and doing well. Um, <laughs> some quite enlightening stories, really. But that, we're hoping, is actually going to be a success, not from the way, perhaps, that we originally thought it, in trying to all these horrid buzzwords like kind of making, giving people ownership of their heritage. No, actually it's educating us. It means that the authority is going to better understand why people value them. It's, we're the ones who are learning there. Um, as a very quick final run through, because I'm on my last few minutes, um, this will be old, uh, old news to a lot of people here, but I thought it very quick to, very useful to finish with a couple of big questions um, that we're wrangling with at the moment. Um, for those who don't know national park purposes, um, up here we go. Dual purpose, conserve and enhance natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage. That's our number one national park purpose. Second, promote opportunities for the understanding and enjoyment of the special qualities. And sitting beneath those is a duty to seek to foster the economic and social well-being of local communities. Now, this is what I find particularly interesting, is that that duty really sits below the statutory purposes, and how do we um, bridge the gap? The Sanford principle was teased just before my talk there. Um, those two purposes, conserve and enhance and um, promote enjoyment, it's been, it's now enshrined in effect that where there is a conflict between the two, conservation takes priority. That, that's, the sand, that's the essence of the Sanford principle, is that where we have something where there is a conflict of should we conserve something or should we promote the enjoyment of it, conservation takes priority. And that's, that's how we, we manage national parks. So, now, these final few questions, um, I have opinions, I don't have answers, and I fully and freely admit that these are issues that people who work in uh, protected landscapes have been and continue to wrangle with. I'm not saying anything new, I'm not even asking any new questions, but I would like, I'd like to throw out there that these, the issues of our field barns in the Yorkshire Dales have brought these questions into quite sharp relief. The first is, is it justifiable to prioritise heritage conservation over allowing landowners to adapt to adopt more economic modes. This in effect, well, the answer probably is yes, because this is the purpose of protected areas and national parks. We are preventing, and we have to acknowledge that, farmers, in this case, from adopting a more economic 
way of living and way of working in order to preserve something that we value for its cultural heritage, sort of, for its significance. Do we need to address that a little bit more? Do we need to relax it? Or are we all completely happy that that is something we're doing and that's the reason for these protected areas? Oh, in, so particularly in the modern environment and in the current climate, when funding is constrained, is the Sanford principle still legitimate? <coughs> well, if we can't, um, if we don't have the money to conserve and enhance, actually, if the only way we're getting money is through tourism, through promoting the enjoyment of these areas, and that is why it's the landscape setting because people want to come and take photos of it. That's the thing. That's why people love all those field barn landscapes in Swaledale. Is the Sanford principle still legitimate in these situations? Do we throw it out? Do we reverse it? Or do we keep it as it is? Um, and finally, it's a little bit more away from what I've been talking about, but um, we have massive concentrations of barns in Swaledale and Wensleydale, and quite a few elsewhere. Do we prioritise all our conservation efforts into one area where there is a distinct landscape and a, con and a huge concentration, and lose the ones elsewhere? In that way, we are creating a false historic landscape because we're removing them from the rest of the areas where they were. We're creating possibly heritage theme parks. We're saying that only here is where the barns remain because we've concentrated all our efforts there. Or do we allow some of those to lose, dilute perhaps some of the special characteristics at the expense of preserving them across a much wider landscape? Um, I don't really have answers. I will be in the pub later. I'm always happy to talk about barns. Um, and I will leave it there. Thank you very much.